Well, former Facebook product manager Francis Haugen yesterday testified before a Senate committee and laid out a source, a, a, a host of allegations against the company. The company's leadership knows how to make Facebook and Instagram safer, but won't make the necessary changes because they have put their astronomical profits before people. Congressional action is needed. They won't solve this crisis without your help. I believe in the potential of Facebook. We can have social media we enjoy that connects us without tearing our apart our democracy, putting our children in danger, and sowing ethnic violence around the world. Now, somewhat unusually, not only did we get a statement from Mark Zuckerberg, the company has also put out a number of its executives into the media firing back against Haugen, saying she was not directly involved in the product development that she was discussing. And Zuck said in a statement, the argument that we deliberately push content that makes people angry for profit is deeply illogical. We make money from ads and advertisers consistently tell us they don't want their ads next to harmful or angry content. And I don't know any tech company that sets out to build products that make people angry or depressed. The moral business and product incentives all point in the opposite direction, do they? Let's talk to Nina Jankowitz, the Wilson Senior Fellow. We last caught up with her, um, as she just reminded me, on January 7th of this year, which was also a very interesting time in terms of social media and the world writ large. Nina, what do you make of Zuckerberg's argument here that it's illogical that the company would send uh, its users down these paths? Well, I think uh, Mr. Zuckerberg himself in that statement is kind of spreading disinformation. My current company, Aletheia Group, which detects, analyzes, and mitigates disinformation over the past year has uncovered a host of uh, angry, divisive content that Facebook has pushed, including networks connected to Chinese national Guo Wenji and Republican strategist Steve Bannon that we assess to be connected with them, uh, people peddling anti-vaccine rhetoric that is obviously threatening public health, and people who are attempting to continue the sort of violence that we saw on January 6th. This is all stuff that Facebook, frankly, is, is feeding the fire with because it is not giving up data and not you know, engendering more transparency with its product. If that's not true, I would I would ask Mr. Zuckerberg to share uh, more of the research that we've seen coming from inside of Facebook, more of the data about how their algorithms govern our social media experience, and more of the content moderation decisions that they make so that companies like mine, researchers like me, can really tell the public what is going on, because that doesn't seem to be in Facebook's interests right now. So Nina, it sounds as though you, you do think uh, Facebook is putting its profits uh, ahead of really just the general public interest. Well, you know, in my research, not only here in the United States, but in countries like Ukraine, what I have seen over and over again over the past five years is that the most divisive, the most uh, the most emotional content on Facebook is the most engaging content, that most enraging content, right? And it, it doesn't matter if uh, what the algorithms are meant to do is it engender your digital uh, public square or your digital living room. What they're actually doing in practice is uh, amplifying hate speech, amplifying disinformation. And there's very little done on the content moderation side to stop all of that. And that leads me to conclude that Facebook is indeed putting its profits ahead of people, ahead of public health, public safety, and our democracy. Um, and that's something that's extremely troubling to me because as we've seen over and over in every whistleblower scandal every week, um, the, the evidence is just stacking up against Facebook, not to mention the open source research that I, my company, and, and others have done that proves the same thing. So again, I would just say that if that is not the case, it's the burden is on Facebook to show us that that's not the case. And we haven't seen that so far. So I think it's now time for Congress to, uh, to compel them to share that information. So aside from sharing information, Nina, of course, there has been a lot of talk about other potential remedies, if indeed you do accept that this is an issue that the company can do more to address. And I heard an interview with uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren yesterday where she put forth what has been an often cited um, solution to this, which would be breaking up the company. And if indeed 
the the algorithm is optimized to take you down more extreme and more engaging paths. I fail to see how breaking it up would solve that. In other words, wouldn't each of them just try and still do that on their own in order to be more competitive with the others? Yeah, you know, this isn't just a Facebook problem. Uh, we have algorithmic biases that we've seen on TikTok, on YouTube, and even to some extent on the non-chronological versions of Twitter that that some people use, right? This is a, an internet-wide problem. And so what I think we need to go uh, more down the path toward is, again, that algorithmic transparency, data sharing, content moderation, decision making, um, all of that should have oversight from either a congressional body or a, a professional body like the FTC. Um, or something like that. And I personally, you know, although I do not think the FTC should have allowed the merger of WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook, that's what are under the bridge at this point. And what we need is, is more oversight so that we can make better rules for the companies to comply with. In the United Kingdom, they're looking at a broad-based online safety legislation that would protect individual groups, including children, people with disabilities, potentially women and other marginalized communities from online harms that, that are um, perpetrated online. And it would actually not only find the companies, but hold their executives accountable uh, for allowing that content to be amplified and spread. And, you know, I don't think that would necessarily fly in the United States, but we need to start considering these actions, these regulatory actions, because the decisions that we make on Capitol Hill as the headquarters of many of these companies are going to have ripple effects around the world. And I thought that was one of the most compelling parts of uh, Francis Haugen's testimony yesterday, that, you know, you know, these decisions aren't only affecting young women in the United States, they're affecting young women in Burma, they're affecting uh, genocide in places all around the world. And uh, the decisions that our lawmakers make, again, have ripple effects. We really have um, an important role to play here, and we've wasted so much time. I think it's really time for bipartisan action and reminding lawmakers that this isn't a partisan issue. Disinformation is a democratic problem. As you mentioned, of course, it's not just limited to Facebook. This is something that a lot of the social media platforms share. We talked to one tech analyst the other day who said one of the companies that frequently gets left out of this conversation is Snap, which we happen to be showing the stock price right now. Are there, is that just because people aren't paying as much attention to it? Or are there any of these social media platforms that are actually doing it right? So there are a little, um, a little different problems, I would say, for Snap and and TikTok because of the focus is on user generated, authentic content. Um, it's a lot more difficult to exact terms of service against coordinated disinformation campaigns on those platforms because it's coming from real, authentic uh, users. And so at that point, you have a real push and pull between somebody's right to freedom of speech and whether or not they get the reach on those platforms. Um, so. Snap, I think, has eluded a lot of scrutiny, but um, because of the way that it, it focuses on user-to-user -user interaction and there isn't this uh, extremely algorithmic drive to the platform, I think um, it's a little safer than something, say, like TikTok, which is uh, pretty analogous. Gotcha. Makes sense. All right, Nina, it is always good to get your perspective on these issues. Hopefully it won't be another what, uh, 10 months before we can catch up again. Nina Jankowitz, Wilson Center Senior Fellow, fellow and also, as you mentioned, Director of External Engagement at the Aletheia Group. Thank you. Appreciate it.